to GSI 10, Geology of the National Parks. My name is Sridhar Anandakrishna and I'll be your guide through some of the beautiful parts of the planet. Uh, last time we talked a little bit about Death Valley, about the spreading, about how Death Valley is going apart. This time we're going to go slightly further north up along that same coast, go up to uh, Crater Lake National Park, an absolutely gorgeous place. Head on up the coast a little bit further up to Mount St. Helens. Go over and take a look at the Olympic National Park and, and really uh, understand why these volcanoes, Crater Lake, Mount St. Helens, why those two volcanoes are where they are. And we're going to actually spread our picture out a little bit beyond that and look at why there are volcanoes in other parts of the world. All right, so uh, we'll uh, start our um, uh, uh, talk about uh, making mountains and making volcanoes, uh, why they are, where they are, and, and what they can tell us about the insides of the earth. Here is a screenshot that I took on my computer of a program called Google Earth. And I encourage all of you to go out there and download it. It's free, it runs on Macs, it runs on PCs, uh, and it's a wonderful program for just looking at this planet. You can wander around to different parts, you can zoom in, zoom out, and, and I really encourage you to download it and to use it. It will really give you a good sense of, of how big this planet is that we live on. Um, I've circled in those sort of blue squiggly lines. Uh, they're uh, not the best pictures in the world, but uh, uh, you can see that there are some places on the west coast of the U.S. Uh, that's California on the bottom, Oregon in the middle, Washington State on top, and the circles represent the areas that we're going to go to. Crater Lake National Park on the bottom, uh, Mount St. Helens in the middle, and then right up on the top, right up jammed up against the Pacific Coast is the Olympic National Park. So as I said, go get yourself Google Earth and you'll be able to zoom in to, to these spots yourself. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can go to your website, go on to Angel, and you'll be able to download what we call V-trips. Uh, uh, they're virtual field trips to these, uh, to these places and to other places. And they're uh, just PowerPoint presentations or uh, web page presentations that just have beautiful pictures of these places. Let me uh, take you to a couple of these places right now. We'll go take a look at Crater Lake. We'll take a look at Mount St. Helens. And then we'll come back and start the lecture proper. I like to do this to, to sort of motivate you to say, man, these are beautiful places. I want to go see them and I want to understand them. I want to know why there is a volcano there. So let's uh, hop out of this program real quick and go over and take a look at Crater Lake National Park. This is on, as I said, this is on Angel. You can see all this for yourself. I'm going to whip through it quickly, but you can find it on there. Uh, so this is just a shot looking down from the rim of Crater Lake through all these lovely trees down onto that blue, blue, blue water. Crater Lake is this volcano way up high in, on the top of this mountain, up at 6,000 feet, and that water is as clear and as beautiful as anything. It's just all snow melt that comes down into the crater. Uh, there are no very few streams that bring in sediments into it, uh, and, and no industry, no pollution, no agriculture, and so that water is as blue and as beautiful as they get on this planet. Here's a picture on the sides, even though this was uh, 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 late in the summer, you get lots and lots of snowfall. As you can see, uh, our friend there is wearing his t-shirt as he slides down the side of Crater Lake in the snow. Even though it's in the middle of summer, there's still lots of snow. So you pull back. Here's a picture of that crater. The bottom of it there is water. You can see the far side of the crater. We're standing on the near rim. It's an almost circular feature. Uh, with this little island called Wizard Island rising up in the middle of it. And then there's the far rim that you can see. And if I could pan, if this camera could pan around, you would see that rim continuing around all the way until it came back to where you are. Absolutely gorgeous place. Way up high in the mountains, as I said, 6,000 feet. It's a spectacular place to go and, and see the world. Here's just another picture looking out over that blue, blue, beautiful water. Here is a uh, very garishly colored picture of the depth of the water. Uh, the, the purples are where the water is very, very deep. And um, 
uh, the gray-white parts are the rim, so you can sort of see that near circular crater with Wizard Lake off on the left side there, that little dome that's starting to build, and then over in the top there's another little dome starting to build. So this has something to do with volcanoes. Let's find out more. And this is just a picture uh, uh, from Crater Lake looking along the Cascade Ranges, and you can see in the distance one, two, three, four volcanoes, each of those perfect little cones marching up the coastline. Why? Why are there volcanoes there? Why aren't there any volcanoes here in central Pennsylvania? Why do they have four of them uh, over there in Oregon and Washington? That seems awfully unfair. They get all the volcanoes and we don't get any. Let's find out why they've got them. Um, here is a map of the California, Oregon, Washington coast. Each of those little triangles is a uh, volcano. Lassen, Shasta, Medicine Lake, Crater Lake, that's the one that, that we're going to be talking about. And on the right you have a little graphic depicting when they most recently have uh, erupted. As you probably might know, Mount St. Helens erupted in 1982, and that's uh, marked on the the right over there, Mount St. Helens, has been very, very active, erupting many, many times over the course of the last 4,000 years, uh, and, and, and it's actually getting even more active even as we speak. That dome is starting to build today, and it might be due for an eruption in the next uh, few uh, years to tens of years. So, Here's just a beautiful peak of Lassen Peak. It's not Crater Lake, but it's another uh, volcanic peak. Whenever you see one of these nice triangular mountains, you should say to yourself, volcano. It's just a beautiful spot. And here's another view of Lassen Peak looking at it uh, from a slightly different place. All right, uh, here is a picture of a little car, a little 1980 Chevette going up the road to, uh, to Lassen Peak. You can see all the snow there, even though it was August. Um, I encourage you to go onto the website and just take this V-trip and, and it will uh, uh, encourage you to go there. This, we went a little bit further afield. Those little white dots are sheep. When you think sheep, you should think New Zealand. And this is indeed a shot of Mount Ruapehu in New Zealand, another volcano on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. All right, enough wandering around the world. Let's learn why those volcanoes are where they are. So, plate tectonics 2, making mountains and volcanoes. Here is a map of the world. And what we're looking at here is North America and the U.S. in the middle. The Pacific Ocean is on the left. And uh, each of those little red dots um, is a uh, source of volcanic activity. And you should be able to see that eat those dots circle the Pacific Ocean. Sure, there's a few volcanoes in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Iceland in particular has quite a few. Uh, there's a few volcanoes that uh, occur in Africa and, and uh, Arabia, but most of them are around the circumpacific. Australia and New Zealand heading up the coast towards Japan, over to Alaska, and then down the U.S. coast, the U.S. and Canadian coast, and then down through Central and South America. Why? Why is it that these volcanoes are where they are? So here's sort of a graphic showing where all of these volcanoes are. And because all these volcanoes stretch right around the Pacific, we call it the Ring of Fire. It's a, it's a nice evocative name. There's another thing that happens that goes along with these volcanoes. It was a curious thing that people noticed is that if you were to take the water out of the Pacific, in the same place where you have all these volcanoes, you'd see these really deep ocean trenches. The ocean would go down um, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, in some places even more, uh, 40,000 feet. It's an extraordinary thing. It goes way, way down, as deep down into the ocean as mountains are high. Why? Why are there trenches that go along with volcanoes, but no trenches anywhere else? That's the second thing that people notice. The third was, that you get these big earthquakes in the same place. Volcanoes, deep trenches, big earthquakes. How are they all related? How do they all come together? All right. And then the next thing is we're going to take a look at one of the great 
uh, songs of all time. Love By the great Johnny Cash. Is a burning thing, and it makes a fiery ring. So, okay, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and you should be grateful that I did not try to sing that for you. So, the overview that we're going to, what we're going to try and go over in this class is um, ocean materials made at spreading ridges. We saw that last time. Death Valley, mid-ocean ridges. So somehow ocean materials made at these uh, mid-ocean uh, spreading ridges. Material comes up, freezes on, spreads off to the side. If you remember that from last time. It collides with continental crust. So all this material is being made in the oceans. It runs into the continent and something's got to happen. All right? And what happens is one of two things. Either you get subduction where that continental cu crust goes uh, over, the oceanic crust goes under the continental crust, this material gets subducted, or you get accretion where the continental crust uh, and the oceanic crust run into each other and they actually glom together to, to create new land. All right? So those are the two things that can happen. Some of the side benefits, if you will, of that collision of either the subduction or the accretion is the creation of volcanoes and mountains and these deep oceanic trenches. The third thing that we'll talk about this time is hot spots. Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, uh, let's talk about subduction and accretion first. The review. This you should remember from last time. The mantle is the deep part of the earth. Way down deep you have this hot, relatively soft rocks that make up the asthenosphere. The upper part of the mantle and this crust are this rigid, more brittle uh, uh, mass of rocks called the lithosphere. And the lithosphere, this upper part, is broken into a number of smaller plates and these plates float over on top of the asthenosphere and they will occasionally run into each other. Where they run into each other, that's where these mountains are made. The convection cells, they bring up this mantle material, it freezes at these mid-ocean ridges and then the ridges get uh, push material off to the side so the ocean is continually moving its crustal material off to the side. That stuff has got to go somewhere. We don't live on an infinite, infinite plane, we live on this nice round planet so if you push stuff off to the side eventually it's got to hit something. And this is my uh, um, depiction of what the earth looks like. If I took the earth and took a great big hatchet and sliced through it, what I would find is uh, I have the outer core and then I have the, or, or the outer uh, uh, lithosphere and then right in the middle of it we would have the inner core which was solid, the outer core that was liquid, and then right up at the surface, this is where we live, there's trees and houses and so on and so forth. Right underneath that we have the crust which is part of the lithosphere. Underneath that we have the mantle, which is this hot, soft rocks. And then right in the middle you have the core, which is either solid right in the middle or liquid outside of it. So this is a little bit of review of, of if I could take this hatchet and slice through the earth and look at it from the side, this is what we think we would see. We don't really know. Nobody's ever drilled into the earth much deeper than a mile or two, a few miles three or four miles. So all of this is inferred from other evidence, but we think this is a pretty good picture of it. It's probably grossly simplified, but this is what we think the world looks like. I'm going to redraw that picture here. Here we have 
the Earth again, sliced through. The upper part of it is called the lithosphere. Underneath that, you have the asthenosphere. And that lithosphere is broken up into a number of little plates. Well, I've just labeled them plate one, plate two, plate three, and so on. So we've taken a cross section through it. In your head, you have to imagine that this thing is a, is a globe or a sphere, and those plates are all riding on top of the surface of that globe or sphere. From the interior of the Earth, uh, because of the heat inside of the Earth and the heating of the rocks that makes them low density, it, that material rises up through the asthenosphere until it gets to the surface of the Earth where it cools off and, uh, and then sinks back down in these convection cells. All right? So this should all be review if you remember it from last time. But what goes on as a consequence of these mantle convection cells is that these plates, plate three there for example, will slide off in one direction and plate two will slide off in the other direction. And when plate two slides off, what happens to it? It runs into plate one. Right? You can see that plate one is in its way. Plate two runs into plate one. Something's got to happen there. And at that collision spot, that's where either subduction or accretion takes place. So let's talk a little bit about this oceanic crust. We have these mantle convection cells, materials coming up from deep inside the earth. It's deposited underneath the oceans and it cools off, gets more dense, gets shoved off to the side. And this mantle material is basically basaltic. Basalt is a mineral. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's heavy in silica, uh, iron and magnesium. It's dark in color. It's relatively dense compared to continental crustal material. Density is a key notion that I've talked about a little bit last time. I'm going to talk about it this time. You'll keep running into it over and over again during this class. When something is dense, it is, for its size, it's relatively heavy. So if I have a bottle of water here, I can fill it up with water, and it will have a certain weight to it. And that, uh, if I divide the weight by the volume of this bottle, I have its density. I could pour this water out, fill it with uh, uh, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, please, always. And it would weigh different. It wouldn't weigh the same as uh, uh, the water in here because oil has a different density than water does. All right? You know this stuff, but it's worth emphasizing it anyway. Ocean floor is mostly basaltic, formed at the ridges. Because we know the Earth isn't getting bigger as this material comes up, it isn't as if there's this material coming from somewhere else, it's all being recycled. It comes up and then it goes back down. The Earth stays the same size. What is subduction? That's a word that you ought to write down, maybe look it up in a dictionary. Uh, to subduct means to go under. Sub, under, duct, I'm not quite sure where that duct comes from, I'm not a, uh, uh, I'm not an etymologist, but subduction means for uh, uh, oceanic crust, as it gets uh, uh, denser, as it moves away from, as it cools down, moves away from the ridge, gets denser, it, uh, it starts to sink back down into, uh, into the mantle. Think of the lava lamp. If you go on to the, uh, uh, onto the Angel website, there's a little movie there. Uh, it's a little bit goofy, but it's fun, in which uh, I have a lava lamp and, uh, and I show you how that material in the lava lamp rises up as it heats up and then it goes to the top and then it sinks back down again. The reason it's sinking down again is it's getting cool, meaning it's getting dense. All right, so that's what's going on there. And this is to remind you, this is the goofy uh, movie that you will find on the website of the lava lamp. As this cooling oceanic crust moves to the side, it'll run into a continent. It might run into a continent. It sometimes does, sometimes doesn't. But in the case of the western US, it does run into the continent. It runs into California, Oregon, and Washington. So this cooling Pacific con oceanic crust is heading eastwards. And there, banging its way, is California, 
Oregon and Washington. They're sitting there in the way and this oceanic crust runs into it. If it is cold enough, if it is dense enough, if it is so dense that it wants to sink down, then it does sink down. It goes underneath the oceanic uh, uh, crust, which is low density and bobs up high and the uh, uh, the continental crust is low density and bobs up high, and so the oceanic crust, which is higher density, will go underneath it. If it is still relatively warm, if it hasn't had time to cool down, only recently it was formed and it runs into uh, the continent, it's still buoyant, it still rides high up there, doesn't want to sink down. Then when the oceanic crust and the continental crust meet, then the uh, oceanic crust doesn't sink down, it just stays up high and you get what's called accretion and we'll talk about that. As this ocean crust sinks down, and I'll draw a picture of it for you in a second, but let me get the words out and then we'll go back and look at this picture. As this ocean crust sinks down, it carries seawater and sediment with it as it goes underneath uh, uh, the continental crust. As it sinks down, it starts to heat up again. Remember, the earth is hot inside. What's the reason for it? You know it. We talked about it last time. The reason it's hot is because of radioactive decay inside uh, the planet. Inside the earth, there's all these radioactive uh, uh, atoms that are slowly splitting apart, giving up a little bit of heat, and so the inside of this planet is warm. So as this oceanic crust sinks down, carrying its water, carrying all these sediments as it sinks down and it starts to heat up. This added water, and this added sediments help that crust to melt. If all we had was that oceanic crust, you could heat it up and you'd have to heat it way, way up before it would melt. But because of all these impurities that have been added, the water and the sediment, that stuff melts really quickly. All right? Most things melt better in the presence of impurities. And this is an example of one of those. So let's take a look at a, uh, a picture of that whole thing. Here's my cross section through the ocean. I've drawn a mid ocean ridge. So you have material coming up from underneath. It's being deposited at this mid ocean ridge. That's that little peak over there. And as it cools, it gets shoved off to the right. So we have material coming up, that material gets deposited, cools, and gets shoved off to the right. There's more material going off to the left, but let's only worry about the stuff that's going off to the right. Here's my picture of the, uh, uh, of the ocean. And there's a little boat and there's a little fishy. So now you know that's the ocean. It's got a fishy in it. And the seafloor there is the black line. And that material is physically moving off to the right. If I could go there and, and, and put, a, uh, 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 put a mark in it, I would come back a year later and that mark would have moved a little tiny bit to the right, maybe half an inch, maybe a tenth of an inch, but it would have moved a little bit. Now, over here on the right in the green, I've drawn the continent. So this is the coast of California. This is the coast of Oregon. What's going to happen? when that black line runs into that green line. The continent is low density. The uh, ocean is basalt, it's high density. When the two run into each other, in this case, because the mid-ocean ridge is way far away, the basalt has had a lot of time to cool down, it's high density, it, it's, uh, it wants to sink back down, and it will. It will subduct down underneath the uh, uh, continental crust. And in the process of subducting, I'm sorry, I had to draw a new picture here because my last one got so ugly. Um, in the process of subducting, it will carry down material with it. That junction there that I've circled in yellow has water and it has ocean sediments with it. So two things happen at that junction. The first is that the continental crust and the oceanic crust get deformed to form these trenches. So without 
this motion of the oceanic crust going underneath the continental crust, we wouldn't have that little dip that you see where the black and the green meet. That part would have just gone flat across. But because of the motion, you can imagine in your head, uh, this, my left hand over here that's wiggling is the ocean crust. My right hand over here is the continental crust. And as I move my hand down, 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 it drags and makes this little triangular indentation that is a mid-ocean ridge. All right? So that's why we have ridges uh, where we have subduction zones. Now if these uh, 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 mid, uh, trenches, sorry, that's why we have trenches where we have uh, subduction zones. That's what this is. This is a deep trench in the ocean floor. If that trench is near a continent, near water, near uh, fresh water, rivers, sediment, that trench will fill up quickly with sediments because the continent will just dump all this material into it. But if that trench is way out in the middle of the ocean, it won't fill up with sediments and it'll be really, really deep. Let's draw another picture of this because my pictures tend to get very messy, so I just erase them and redraw them. Once again, we have this subducting ocean crust going under a continent. At that junction there, you'll have a trench. But in addition to that, you'll have sediments that are carried down, sediments and water, that are carried down with that subducting trench. As that material goes down, it helps that basalt to melt. As it heats up, remember, as it's going down, 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 it is getting hotter and hotter. Eventually, it gets so hot that it melts. And when things melt, they get low in density. When things are low in density, they rise. And that's what those little red circles are. It's molten material that's rising up through the continental crust. Because now you've melted this combination of basaltic rock, water, and sediment. You've heated it up. It's melted. It's got nowhere to go because it's low density, nowhere to go but straight up. And that's what it does. When it gets to the top, it builds a mountain. So when this material gets to the top, it builds a volcano. That volcano there is Mount St. Helens. That volcano there is Crater Lake. That volcano there is Mount Ruapehu in uh, in New Zealand. It's Mount Fuji in Japan. So when it's Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. So when you get subduction, you get these deep trenches being formed. You get this melt down there that rises up somewhere back from the coast, not right at the coast, but some distance back from the coast. That melt gets hot enough that it can rise up. And when it rises up, it forms a volcano. All right? So that's where, that's why these things go together. Subduction, uh, uh, trenches, volcanoes, lines of volcanoes. You can imagine in 3D that uh, uh, coastline of, that green line is a cross section through the uh, west coast of California, but that's just one spot on the west coast of California. If I were to go a little bit down into the screen there, I'd be up in Oregon or up in Washington, and there'd be another volcano, and another one, and another one. And that's why there's this line of volcanoes all up uh, uh, the coast of uh, California, Oregon, and Washington. And over time, these volcanoes get bigger and bigger because there's more and more material that's continually coming up and being deposited. Now, they don't keep getting bigger forever because there's erosion that will continue to make them smaller, and uh, this process that continues to make them bigger, and that fight between uh, uh, building mountains and tearing down mountains is what geology is all about. You'll learn all about erosion later on. So here we have volcanic mountains at uh, subduction zones. So I hope this gives you a picture of it. I know these drawings are very crude, but they're very, very helpful for me. If you want more information, you've got to read the uh, online textbook. This is Mount St. Helens, this is Lassen Peak, this is Crater Lake, this is Fuji, this is Mount Ruapehu, this is all of these uh, uh, subduction zone volcanoes around the Ring of Fire. Okay. 
I'm going to draw that 3D picture for you. I'm not a good artist, but there's some folks at the U.S. Geological Survey that are good artists, and they have shown this process where one plate is subducting under another plate, and you, now you can see it in 3D. It isn't just a single spot the way I drew it on my uh, rather crude picture, but it heads all the way up along that uh, uh, suture, that contact, that uh, where those two plates run together, the one goes under and you just get this series of volcanoes uh, all up and down that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, contact and you get these big old trenches along there. This type of a volcanic rock, the rock that comes up at a subduction zone and forms those volcanoes is called andesitic. It's an andesite. It's named after the Andes Mountains. It's a very uh, 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 noticeable mixture of basalt and these sediments uh, that forms this andesitic rock. Now, remember at the beginning I said there were three things that go along with subduction zones. One was volcanoes. The second was these deep trenches. The third was earthquakes. And the reason for the earthquakes is occasionally that that downgoing slab, that downgoing oceanic material, as it's sliding down underneath the continental crust, will get stuck and get stuck. And the downgoing slab is pushing, pushing, and then suddenly it breaks loose. And you get these huge earthquakes because of the enormous forces. And unfortunately, you get very tragic consequences because one of the things that happens when these uh, earthquakes occur is that they displace a great deal of water in the oceans. And when those water waves hit land, if there's people that are standing there, they can and unfortunately are uh, killed by the hundreds, the thousands, and in the case of that dreadful, dreadful uh, tsunami in uh, December of 2004 in Indonesia, uh, killed by the hundreds of thousands. So these are very, very dangerous things indeed. Trenches, we already talked about trenches. When the slab is subducting, it deforms the overriding plate, and then we get these long linear trenches. If these trenches are near land, they get filled up with sediment because there's lots and lots of junk, if you will, that's being washed off of uh, the coast of Oregon, the coast of Washington, the coast of California. All those rivers are carrying lots and lots of sediments and they'll fill up those trenches quickly, but if they're out in the middle of the ocean, then uh, they won't be filled up quite so quickly. Those uh, trenches in the middle of the ocean are some of the deepest places on the planet. The Marianas Trench is the deepest spot on the planet. It's as deep as Mount, as Mount Everest is high. So Mount Everest, you know, is 28,000 feet high, and uh, 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 the Ma uh, Marianas Trench is, is actually a little bit deeper than that, below the seafloor. The trenches near continents, because of all this mud that gets washed out, tends to fill up more quickly. Marianas Trench is here, just off of the Philippines, and uh, it, as I said, it's one of the deepest places on the planet. There's a little bit of a, uh, a, a side, side note here. I think I remember I, I mentioned last time this little symbol up in the corner there. That's my universal symbol that the train is going off, the choo-choo train is going off the tracks. So whenever you see that, you know that you can uh, uh, not pay attention for a minute. You can stretch. But the first, the best ever science fiction is Jules Verne's uh, uh, 20,000 Leagues, whoops, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. That was a, movie, uh, a, a novel by Ju Jules Verne. 20,000 Leagues, that's about 60,000 miles. Jules Verne was referring to the length of the voyage uh, that the, the submarine, the Nautilus, made with Captain Nemo at the helm. And it's a great, great read. I strongly urge you to rush off and, and find it. Okay, so here is once again our picture of the west coast of the U.S. You have in the blue is the uh, 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 Pacific Ocean and the oceanic crust associated with it. It's moving off to the east. And then in the pink you have 
uh, the continental crust and it's staying relatively stationary and the two will collide where you have that collision you get subduction or further up you get accretion. This is important to remember continents are the lowest density quote light when I put I put that in quotes because it's not the weight that matters it's not the weight that matters it's the weight of a, 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 of a particular given volume of the material all right so I can get a pound of uh, feathers or I can get a pound of gold but a pound of feathers would fill this room and a pound of gold uh, would uh, uh, would fit in the palm of my hand all right so it's not the total weight of something that matters it's the it's the weight per unit volume seafloor is the uh, denser of the two the basalt is a more dense material uh, mantle is denser still so I yeah, got to always remember it's density that we care about the core is the densest of all it's mostly iron accretion occurs when the seafloor runs into the continent but it's still relatively low in density it hasn't gotten so dense that it wants to sink down it's it's quote light it's low density and so when it runs into the continent it doesn't sink down it doesn't give way it actually smears onto uh, uh, it's scraped off some of this sediment is smears onto uh, onto the onto the um, uh, continent next time or, or a little ways down the road we'll talk about something called abduction when two continents collide and 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 man neither of them really want to give way and you get huge mountains built that way here the uh, oceanic crust it has some high, slightly higher density than the continental crust and so it sort of wants to go down but it's still buoyant and so it kind of scrapes along underneath just under the bottom of the continental crust and then all this sediment gets scraped off and 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 spackled onto the side of the continent so it makes this messy messy story that's really hard to interpret but that's what geology is as a consequence of all of this the rocks in the bottom of the ocean are never really that old they're produced and then they get subducted somewhere else far away and because they're moving to the side Sure, they're moving slowly. They're only moving this much every year. And so it takes them a long time to get any distance at all. But we got lots of time. We'll find out later on in this class that the Earth is really, really old. We've had lots and lots of time to do everything we want to do. And so the ocean, uh, it's produced over here. It's destroyed over there. And it might take 100 million years to do it. But uh, uh, eventually, all of the ocean floor will, will, will be destroyed and then recreated somewhere else. Continents are very different. Continents are very light. They bob up. They stay up there. They never get recycled. Continents can be as old as 4 billion years. And we'll talk about how we know the age of, uh, age of rocks. And here is a nice uh, picture that... Um, again from the USGS uh, showing how as the Pacific plate goes down underneath uh, the North American plate it some of the material gets scraped off and smeared onto the side and the Olympic Mountains are uh, produced during that scraping off process um, there's a v-trip for the Olympics uh, that uh, you can go to and look at on your on the website it's a beautiful spot lots and lots of uh, it rains a lot, as you probably know. It's near Seattle, and Seattle is a, as you probably know, is a rainy spot. So it rains a lot over there. But as a consequence, you get lots of beautiful uh, wildlife, lots of beautiful uh, greenery, huge trees, and then you got these mountains in the background. So I urge you to go and and run this V trip and have a look at it. It's a it's a beautiful thing. As I said before. When seafloor runs into these continents, the sediments get scraped off. And the Olympic National Park, where this V-trip was taken, is a good example of that. So, to review, the mantle is hot. Mantle is deep down inside the earth. It's hot. You make these convection cells. Right up at the top, the upper part 
of uh, the, the, the Earth called the crust and the upper part of the mantle together make up the lithosphere that's broken up into a few, about eight major plates and one or two, a few smaller ones. And these plates float around on top of uh, this, uh, on top of the asthenosphere. When plates meet, one of three things can happen. Either the plates run into each other, either the plates are moving away from each other, or the plates are just sliding past each other. And there's different geology that happens at each of those intersections. What we've been talking about today is where plates run into each other. When they run into each other, if it's an ocean plate running into a continental plate, then you get subduction or accretion. And in other cases, you have other behavior. Heat from radioactive decay drives the whole thing. Thank you.